Thank you for sharing the peace of Christ with one another. <laughs> At this time in our invocation, we ask that you would prepare your minds and hearts.
I greet you in the name of God, the Father Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I greet you on this beautiful summer fall day. And we thank him for this day. And we welcome you to the congregation of Grace United Methodist, a part of that great church of Christ. Would you stand with me, please? I serve a risen Savior. He's in our world today. I know that he is living, whatever those may say. We have this hope in a word of tor- world of turmoil. Christ is alive. Please join me in a prayer of God's people. Heavenly Father, you have done your greatest work through the frailty of your Son. He lived among us, died for us, and rose victorious to give us new life. Fill us this day with new hope that we may have the power to follow Christ every day. In the name of Christ we pray.
Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. Thank you for your offering. When it comes to prayer, where do we begin? Would you bow with me, please? Lord, help us always to begin by humbling ourselves before you, to not demand or to instruct but to look for you, for, to you for guidance and direction. To look to you for help and, and closeness, comfort, care. Lord, there's so much to pray for. So many problems. But first, we need every, each and every day, Lord, to thank you for what you've given us and to appreciate the goodness of this life, the goodness of each day, the goodness of the opportunities that you've given us to worship you, and to know you and love you. Lord, this day we ask that you would be with the Tim Taggart family and that congregation, the school, all who've worked with him. Be with them all, Lord, and give them comfort. 
for Ron Shiley and family in his care, for John Downing in his care and for his healing. We ask you to be with them, Lord. We ask you to give us a worldly prayer today and always that we would remember all of those in need around the world, that we would remember your church and the challenges it faces around this world. Lord, we ask that we might be guided by your word and your will to help those that in any way possible Lord, this day we ask for prayers for our leaders of our nations, nations around the world, Lord. We ask for peace. We ask for patience. We ask that we may work together for the greater good. Lord, you give us much to pray about. Help us to remember to pray without ceasing. And thank you, Lord, for the prayer that you have given us to guide and direct our prayers. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now the ushers will assist us in receiving our morning offering.
Heavenly Father, we stand before thee with open hearts, ready to do thy will. Accept our tithes, offerings, and gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It is a beautiful day to be alive, is it not? Yeah. Somewhat of a rhetorical question for you this morning. What would make a man, a man who held three doctorates, doctor of medicine, doctor of philosophy, a theologian, doctor of theology. What would make a man who was recognized as one of, as probably the leading organist in Europe and in his day, what would make him move to an area that had no organs? What would make this man who had the skills of a doctor, what would make him move to an area that, well, it he literally worked out of a, uh, a chicken house, they called it. For nine months, he served thousands of patients, he and his wife. What would make a man do that? What would make a man who had a teaching position in Vienna, Austria, what would make him go deal with people who who were still so lost in superstition and lost to the world. 
What would make a man do that? Albert Schweitzer heard these words in his heart. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in hell where he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot. Not can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and they have the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Lord, may we hear your words in our heart here today. Amen. I saw in the lectionary when Byron called and asked that, that I fill in for him today that I saw in the lectionary this parable and I said, oh my, haven't, haven't we heard that message so many times? In fact, I rem and just as I was reading it here, I had this recollection that came to me that I, when I was working here, how many years ago? that I was a student pastor here, I don't know, 40, 50, I, well, anyhow, it was a long time ago. I remember reading that portion of scripture because I mispronounced, I got nervous and mispronounced that chasm part. I remember that. But it must be important to have these things repeated to us because Jesus said this in this message he gave to us in so many different parables, in different ways. The parable, the simple story, simple spiritual and moral message in a story. He was trying to get through to people who thought their riches would, were a part of their godliness. Constantly he preached to these Pharisees who came to listen to him, but they must not have changed their attitude because he kept it up. He kept trying to get through to them, much like he's probably trying to get through to us today. The Pharisees considered wealth to be proof of righteousness. And the Old Testament talks about those uh, with many crops, with many grains, barns full of grain, with other things, uh, big families, uh, that they got to thinking, I'm doing something right. God is blessing me because I'm doing so much right. And if somebody had a terrible disaster happen to them, well then, oh, I don't know what they did, but that must have been a terrible sin to make that happen. 
this isn't the words of Jesus, but I have to say from what I understand of them, that's some stinking thinking. Jesus did not despise the rich of his day. He despised their attitudes. And that hasn't changed. The rich man did not go to hell for being rich. He did not go to hell. We don't hear in this portion of scripture, this is a simple message. We don't hear how mean he was to Lazarus. We don't hear how he went out the city gate and kicked them every morning, you know. And we don't hear how he mistreated him. We just hear how indifferent he was to his plight, to his hunger, to his needs. Just sounds like he was part of the landscape. I added this, uh, found this quote by George Bernard Shaw, who many of you are very familiar with. I thought it expressed it quite well. The worst sin to our fellow creatures is not to hate them, but to be indifferent to them. That's the essence of inhumanity. To be indifferent. To show no compassion. If he is anything like many of us, he probably blames the victim. I know I do at times. I'm sorry, Lord. But I know I've slipped into that thought pattern. Uh, I can remember from uh, a quote from childhood days, you know, that, uh, um, well, I'm getting too negative with all that now. It's just that many of us blame the, the victim. Uh, you know, this poor beggar, he must have, uh, but he made bad choice. He must be, you know, he must be a bad guy, to, you know, to, to end up in that straits. You know, don't we, we look down on other people because of their misfortune? Compassion. I read of compassion in the paper yesterday. It said that a judge uh, overruled and he has decided that they should stick with a, an attitude, a, a belief that the detention centers need to release these children that are being held to release them to their family. If uh, they can establish families, they need to release them to them in this country and do it quickly. It's an old ruling. But the judge found compassion. And if he is anything like many of us, yeah. well, the judge ruled that on Friday it reminded me of when we got up in first grade. You remember how in first grade they, uh, the teacher asked, uh, now, little Johnny, what do you want to be when you grow up? Little Ricky, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. Oh, well, I want, to be a, uh, I want to be an astronaut, or I want to be a fireman, or a police chief, or, or I want to be a rich man. You know, I want a boat and a fancy car, and I want to be a race car driver. And I'm, I want to, I want to, I want to. And then he goes to the next person. The teacher goes to the next person and says, now, now, Billy, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to be a poor beggar on the street. I want to be sore all the time. I don't want a pillow for my head. I want to sleep in the streets. I want to be cold and starving. I want to be really bad, in bad shape. You don't remember that, do you? It never happened. That's what God wants us to remember. Nobody wants to be there. I used to kind of go by the argument that, that uh, all of us had an inward sense of right and wrong. That when somebody was making a wrong decision, that they, they always really knew it. But I think I've changed that thought of it. A lot of people have 
been trained or indoctrinated or, or never told. They don't know they're making a bad decision. Blaming the victim for being a beggar at the gate. That just doesn't cut it with God. The judge showed compassion. I don't know where the Pharisees got such a notion that they were better because they were rich. But the Old Testament goes on and on about caring for the poor. There's tons of scripture. From Proverbs 31, verses 8 and 9. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Compassion for all. I looked up the word compassion. It uh, says that it's a sympathetic pity and concern for sufferings or misfortunes of others. It's not always something that we practice, compassion. But we should learn. Sometimes we learn the hard way. After World War I, we figured those German people and the Austrians and others, well, they got what they deserved. So we just, we didn't help. Nobody, none of the countries helped. They didn't do anything for them. They just let them suffer. And unemployment, poverty. And what grew out of that? Anybody? After World War I in Germany? World War II. The Nazis. The Nazis, I should say. As a world, we should learn to be compassionate. And as a Christian, well, as a Christian, it is our best interest as followers of Christ to show compassion, or we may go to hell. We need to ask ourselves, who is that homeless person at our gate? Who is our neighbor who needs our help? It's not easy for preachers to talk about judgment because it's a sad state that we've come to. It's, we've arrived at our point in our society where we think that uh, Everybody should get a participation trophy, right? But that's not the way Christianity works. Christianity demands more than participation. Christianity, being Christ-like, demands action, demands attitude, demands compassion. It's sad to say, but the survey's out and that uh, most Americans do not even believe in a literal hell anymore. Thank goodness Schweitzer did. He changed a ton of lives. He saved so many lives. We've done a wonderful job of convincing ourselves that God loves us. But we've done a poor job convincing ourselves that our actions have consequences. Or our lack of action. It may not be our badness that will send us to hell. It may just be our lack of goodness. Now, yes, I have been there too. Um, sometimes the studies they say that some of us are literally suffering com from compassion fatigue. 
We've tried to help and we've been kicked in the teeth one too many times. We just want to escape, stay away, walk through the gate without looking, binders on. But the poor and disenfranchised. Well, this scripture is pointing out they're God's special people. You see, we never did learn the name of the rich man. But God knew the name of Lazarus. We dare not let them, them, we dare not let those who need us become part of the landscape. The only rebuke from Jesus in the scriptures was when he tried to keep telling people not to shut out others from God's love and God's care and God's grace. I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by reminding us that that big gulf hasn't changed. The thing that puts us on one side of the gulf or the other may certainly be our attitude, our lack of compassion, this parable tells us. A simple moral message, a simple spiritual message. Isn't it ironic the way this story closes with Abraham pointing out that even if someone rose from the dead, that they still would not accept. And here it is, Jesus, who rose from the dead. And people still didn't listen. I pray we're listening today. Have compassion. When we say in this world, we talk about the big C. Uh, we may be talking about the, we may think of the terrible disease of cancer. But as Christians, when we discuss God's love, I would suggest to us that the big C stands for compassion. Remember that uh, Sunday school song you used to sing, or camp song, I am a C, I am a C H. I'm not going to make you sing that today. I'm a terrible song leader. You want, you want to lead us? No? Oh, okay. thought maybe I'd offer Cindy a chance. In closing today, I think that uh, I always like to have some kind of a, a prop or a or have you do something to, to uh, convince yourselves that you've heard it and, uh, and to commit yourselves. But I just couldn't come up with anything except the big C. You know? So maybe as I lead you in our closing prayer here, if you bow your heads and close your eyes, maybe you just make that C with your hands. And put them on your lap or Hold it next to your heart or something. Just commit yourselves. I've heard Jesus' message again today. And I hope it sinks in. Would you bow with me, please? Lord, you cared for us so much that you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ, to die on the cross that our sins may be forgiven. Help us. Help us, please, to pass on that kind of love, care, and compassion to all of your children. Lord, help us to remember that each and every creation, each and every person is your creation. And you love them. 
And we need to love them too. To call ourselves Christ-like. To call ourselves Christians. Help us, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's children said, Would you stand and let us sing together our closing hymn, I Surrender All, number 354. See, I must have rushed through things. I was admiring the copy of the Apostles' Creed that was taped to the pulpit here. 
I know most of you have memorized it. Would you join with me, please? Let us unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before I pronounce the benediction, I remembered I wanted to tell you, do not follow in Schweitzer's tracks. Don't sell everything today and go to Africa. Maybe, maybe, I guess I, I'm being too complete here. Uh, you know, maybe you've been called to do that. Okay, but for most of us, we certainly don't need to because the need is in our own backyards. The need is in the sidewalks of Oil City. The need's in the grocery store. The need, it's everywhere. Let's not turn our backs. Let's not be indifferent. May we show compassion to all. Grant, O Lord, that what has been said with our lips we may believe in our hearts, and that what we believe in our hearts we may practice in our lives. Through Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen.